Hugh Yanis. Um, and thank you to Natasha, uh, obviously also. Thank you to everyone at CHS. Um, it's a bit of a homecoming thing after more than two decades that have passed since I've held my fellowship there. Um, first year of Gregory Nage's directorship. That goes way back in time. Um, if only we were to gather and meet in person today, but this is also not so bad. So thank you to everyone at CHS for putting this up and for running this as smoothly as it's been so far. Um, speaking to you from uh, scenic Westphalia, rather different from Washington than from Washington DC, but there you have it. Um, completely different perspective now, uh, completely different topic as it were, different side of the same coin, Thebes, Boeotia, and the Battle of Plataea perspectives from the Cadmia. And uh, Natasha struck me yesterday when in her introduction, she talked about the magic and the glory and the victory that is being remembered. On the one hand, when we uh, talk about uh, Plataea 2500, um, and at the same time, she mentioned this also, we talk about horror, death, and destruction all over. Now, my talk is neither of this, as it were, although everything when we talk about battle is horror, death, and destruction. What I'm trying to do over the next 20 minutes or so is to explore the view of a group on the Persian War, a group that looks on the Persian War and that sees a thorny legacy, that sees the challenge of overcoming something that isn't a glorious thing to remember and that is nothing to bank on as they march ahead, as they march forward to build a society and shape a city's future. Now, obviously, the Theban perspective on the events leading up to the campaign and the actual fighting as well, we've learned so much about this already. All this is referenced by, but also utterly blurred by Herodotus. Um, although often erroneous, truffled with tropes, implausibilities, Paul Cartledge talked about this yesterday, contradictions, although all of this is the case, Herodotus continues to be the most successful narrative. Erroneous, wrong names of commanders, truffled with tropes, Ataginos' uh, famous symposium, as if this were a reality. Many scholars cite this as something as if it had happened the way Herodotus references it implausibilities, 400 hostages held by 300 men, um, and so on. But the greatest challenge I find, and the greatest challenge that has already, has already popped up here and there in our conversations over the past two days, is that of discursive distortion. And by that, I mean that Herodotus's work is written in and indicative of a public discourse environment that is rather remote from the Persian War. How remote is open to debate and, in, in, and indeed in need of uh, clarification, something we have touched upon already and I'm sure we will return to again. So how representative is the spirit of freedom, liberation, and Athenian embodiment of Hellenicity? Sentiments so prominent in the 450s, 440s, and then merging into the Peloponnesian War. How representative, how is this representative of the Persian War, the periods, the decades leading up to the Persian War? Uh, Herodotus has a clear stance, um, his uh, uh, 
position and his narrative depiction of Thebes is, uh, is, is famous and has been mentioned uh, uh, here. It's not for nothing that Herodotus is the one who introduces the word medism into uh, Greek historiography. Uh, for, for Plataea itself, he preserves the best atrocity for the very end. Um, when the battle is over, the Megarians depart from the plain, the Thebans catch sight of them, charging them on horseback. They fall upon the defenseless Megarians. You couldn't be nastier than that. And two chapters earlier, in 967, Herodotus makes it already clear what the motivations are. While most Hellenes fought in the Persian camp, when they did that, they did that in a lukewarm manner. Um, and we've heard explanations about the uh, Phocians and Macedonians uh, yesterday. Uh, the Thebans were, quote, uh, keen to fight and not to play the card. They were really keen to stick it at their fellow Hellenes. Um, it's hard to establish a narrative that is independent from and separate from uh, what Herodotus has to write and what Herodotus has to say. And let me be very clear about this. What follows is by no means a rescue mission. What follows is the idea and the attempt of an emic view. Um, for instance, Pindar uh, in Ismianate offers a unique glimpse, I believe, uh, when the ode reflects a feeling of sorrow for Thebes' role in the war, which is also mingled with joy at the liberation. It says that a god has turned away from over our heads the stone of Tangelus, uh, the unbearable labor for Hellas, the terror has gone by. The ode then continues to praise the healing force of freedom, which straightens, quote, the crooked way of life. It's also full of references to great sorrows, uh, to pain, to ills, and toil. All of this um, mirrors grief over the loss of many men, for sure. But at the same time, these points air a sense of disaffection with what happened in Thebes. And as such, I believe the poem hints at a certain degree of apprehension, if not even a state of disarray at Thebes, right after Plataea. But that's after Plataea. That's after the war is, the campaign is over. And that's after the Thebans had been punished for what they have done. But how did we get there? It's almost like this deep sigh of both the actor and the historian uh, resembling the king of Rohan at Helm's Deep before the battle of the clam saying, how did we get to this point? How is this possible? My quest for the emic view and my quest for how the Thebans got to that point begins with the ever turning wheel of time years and seasons one after the other after the other the slow motion of time or sometimes not so much a slow motion but a process that is dramatically accelerated before it returns again to the flow of something a little slower but nonetheless deeper Bear in mind, we talked about the environment already that in Herodotus's depiction alone, we find plenty of natural landmarks, foothills and paths of Mount Kitaron, the Azopos River, the so-called Termodon River, the Oeroe River, the Moloes River. These are only some of the most prominent landmarks. There are settlements involved in the immediate vicinity of the path, the immediate vicinity, Thebes, Eritrae, Hussei, Skolos, Plataea, Glissas, Tanagra, all mentioned by Herodotus by name, as well as precise locations. We talked about the twofold, at least twofold double nature of these features, the spring of Gargafia, 
the three heads or three oaks, depending on how you want to call them, sanctuary of Hera Plataea, the sanctuary of Eleusinian Demeter at a place called Argiopion, a grove of Demeter, an island in front of Plataea, etc. We talked about these things. And it was very illuminating, I believe, what we have learned yesterday in that these places became prominent landmarks in Herodotus's battle description and later turned into prominent places of memory. But please bear in mind that those places, all of them on your screen, have also had a long history before the arrival of the Persians. They weren't made in the campaign of Plataea. They became places associated with the Battle of Plataea and Herodotus in particular, but they were there a long time before. So a long time before the Persians had come to this area, at least for and traceable for those of us who follow the history of Thebes and Boeotia in the archaic period, traceable into those areas, Thespiae, Thebes, Scholos, Tanagra, Oitrus, Panormos, and others are um, prominent, um, uh, prominent sites um, that uh, Plataea, Husia, and, and, and Eritrae that have their own local dynamics and their own history of local interactions that uh, governs the ways they see the world around them. And we know quite a bit about those interactions. We know about the reg regional entanglement and about a history of local violence. Two examples listed and cited from SEG speak of sixth century dedications at Olympia that highlight interactions between Tanagra and other cities, other places. One made by the Tanagraeans themselves, um, something to commemorate victory in battle, while another was dedicated by a Boeotian community to celebrate its victory over Tanagra. You win some, you lose some. And so we move on. Another famous incident is, of course, related by Herodotus himself. And we all are aware of this in book six, when he relates the circa 519 campaign against Plataea, um, the Plataeans hard pressed by the Thebans, uh, the Plataeans successfully supplicate to the Athenians, uh, who evidently promise support. The Thebans then launch a campaign Again, a very local affair so far. They launch a campaign, as Herodotus famously puts it, to force the uh, Plataeans to partake in the Boeotians, an uh, odd translation, uh, to participate in the Boeotian, in Boeotian affairs. Now, before Baal is joined, there is an arbitration and a new boundary is set um, so that no Theban force or any other um, uh, Theban uh, engagement would force um, others to be part of the Thebans or part of the Boeotian ethnos if they did not want to be part of this. Um, despite this arbitration, so we note that this is an ongoing affair. There is a, a campaign, an arbitration, conversations, um, the threat of violence. Um, despite the arbitration, the Thebans attack the Athenians near Plataea, but they are defeated. And a new boundary is made. They set, says Herodotus, they set the river Osopos as the boundary for Husiae and Plataea against the Thebans. That's in circa 519. Note how this reference in Herodotus resonates with epigraphic attestations of the Boyotoi that surface at around the same time, second half of the sixth century BCE in various sanctuaries in Akraifnion and elsewhere where we have dedications in, the, in Delphi, uh, dedications that mention the Boyotoi as a collective. So as a group, 
that is as real as it is referential in these conversations, conversations between local communities. So a new boundary is set in 519, but that doesn't do it. Herodotus again continues to tell us that things were far from being sold and violence in the area continues in a famous campaign from about 506 that is also known for a long time, both from Herodotus and from two fragments in Meigs and Lewis of something that Herodotus cites. He cites the inscription, actually uh, a dedication made on the Acropolis by the Athenian victors who say that the Boeotian and Chalcidian peoples were tamed by the sons of the Athenians in works of war who quelled their arrogance in dark bonds of iron and set up these horses, that's the monument, as a type uh, for Pallas. Now, many of you are aware that Herodotus is highly, I'm just saying implausible, highly implausible narrative. Uh, it makes Athenians and Boeotians and Chalcidians fight like twice in the same day on two different locations. And notably the Athenian hippies are the same that move around and roam around the area and they win two battles in one. It's not really plausible. Uh, we realized that a famous Kioniskos from Thebes late sixth century, Edikio Prinkeps by Vasily Aravandinos um, has come to light that sheds different light on the campaign in the sense that it mentions places that relate to this campaign that are not mentioned by Herodotus. It also seems to mention that is the lengthy in, uh, interpretation of Vasily, Vasily Aravantinos that those who dedicated this monument in Thebes went as far as to capture something in the Eleusinian countryside, as far as Eleus is down at the Saronic Gulf, and that Lusaminoi, that they freed something, someone. Whereas in Herodotus' story, it's utter disgrace. They are being uh, they are, they, they, these prisoners, the Theban prisoners are, are, are being uh, uh, ransomed and by their fellow uh, Thebans for yeah, a, the payment of a high ransom. It's, it's, it's the exact opposite. Huh? Um, Vasily Aravantino said, well, this is written in, in quite some pride, with pride and with, with a certain sense of certainty and self-assurance. Whereas Herodotus has a has a humiliating story to tell about those terrible Thebans. Note also how Herodotus continues after this event with Theban Aeginetan relations, which culminates in their alliance in Herodotus. Um, and note how the Thebes Eleusis corridor from Thebes south across uh, Kitairon, uh, 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 past Eritrae, Plataea and Eritrae, uh, past the Athenian fortress uh, of Eleuterae um, into Attica is critical for this alliance. So note how we talk about a region that is for the final decades, the closing decades of the sixth century, critical to what the Thebans and others are doing in Boeotia at that time a long time before a first Persian soldier had put their foot on the ground there. Now, interestingly enough, um, new epigraphic evidence from Thebes sheds exciting new light on these processes. This slide and the subsequent slides come from uh, a pre-publication of texts in a volume uh, by uh, Nikolaos Paparzakadas. Uh, Nikolaos was in the audience earlier today. I don't know if he's with us at this point, um, but uh, it, it's, uh, this is an article by, by Matayu. It's referenced in my bibliography, but the volume is edited by, by Nikolaos Paparzakadas and he has those various texts assembled 
for us. This one is an intact bronze tablet uh, with writing on both sides, which records um, leased or sold landed properties um, with owners and various properties as well as property sizes. Really interesting. What's interesting for us here is that the text establishes in its pre-publication that one of the properties was Eb Azopoi, so on that or near the river, while others were located Diazopo, presumably across the river from Thebes. So most likely um, the issuance of land titles on the other side of the river, Asopos, was possible only until the Plataean alliance with Athens from 519 that we had just discussed. Um, but was there also a connection between the assigning of land to the south, the Asopos by the Thebans, and the Plataeans' refusal to join the Boeotian League? Hard to tell. It's probably best to await final publication of the text. But the text, it's a snapshot, obviously, but it shows us how the Thebans branch out into the Parasopia and how they hand out land lots, landed properties in that region, and engage in that region. This included violent interactions, most likely. Another tablet, also in Nicolaus's volume, um, from about the same time, um, records an arbitration over disputed land. The opposing parties are the Megarians, as well as an enigmatic, we don't know anything about this at this point, an enigmatic union of Thebes and Eloiterai. I just mentioned Eloiterai as the border fortress. So the contested territory most likely will have been between Eloiterai and Megara, perhaps some pastures toward Igostena uh, that you had also seen on, on the map, although the precise location cannot be retrieved from the tablet at this point. Again, collaboration between Thebes and the fortress and site of Eloiterai suggests that the document presumably dates before the 519 summoned. And it's an arbitration. So hence, it's something that happens in response to another act of violence that had happened before. So note that Herodotus's Theban massacre among Megarian troops at Plataea, we had just mentioned this at the beginning, not just by means of conjecture, but by means of certainty, had an earlier history of violence to it. We could stretch this back in the literary tradition to the battle over Salamis and uh, the violent uh, competitions between Salamis, Megara, Thebes, uh, and, and, and Athens in the time of Solon in the early 6th century, and then basically run through the 6th century to arrive at these very and highly localized and, 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 and highly truncated, as it were, compartmentalized documents. But we get the sense here, we get the gist here, I believe, and that is we're roaming through a highly competitive environment, one in which individual stakeholders pursue their goals in a rather upfront, if not aggressive manner. It has nothing to do with the Persian War. I'd like to conclude with another document. Um, this time not a, a, a pre-publication, but a publication by uh, uh, Nicolaus Papatsakaras from the same volume, a four-line epigram in honor of fallen men from Thebes that's written in two different versions. Um, according to Nicolaus, uh, this according, based on letter form observation states to the late sixth century, um, the epigram praises men who had died for their patris and or, not clear, had displayed during funeral games, atla krate staratas, lines four and eight printed for you here. 
Um, it's amazing what Nicola, Nicolas did and made with this text when you look at the stone. Um, rather disheartening. Um, but what we learn from this then is if the text relates to the campaigns of, uh, oh, wow, there is a typo here. If the text relates to the campaigns of the Persian Wars, um, 480, 479, to the Persian War era, quote, the new epigram permits us a unique, albeit indirect, glimpse into a critical moment of the Greco-Persian Wars from the perspective of Medizing Greeks. And again, these men don't speak and they don't see themselves as it were and don't portray themselves as it were as victims to something and they don't speak out of shame. They have something to celebrate. They have something to say. And it matters to them, to their local community, and to the way it positions itself in that critical period after the Persian War. So what? As the tide wave of violence swept through central Greece, communities were forced to position themselves. It's difficult to assert just how charged the Hellenic argument was at the time. Um, something I had tried to alert us to at the beginning of my uh, intervention. Yeah. Um, it's there in the aftermath of the war and we understand the argument in events leading up to the war, but how prominent is it in 510 or in 500 or in 490? I would urge us to adopt a radically historical point of view and unpack it from that perspective. Lived experience from local histories of violence in the decades prior to the arrival of the Persians informed the ways in which cities responded to that challenge. In the southern Theban Chora, as much as in the Asapos Valley and beyond, in this sense, the local was a sure, inevitable compass for those different and various war parties. In the aftermath, and that's a curious pun, in the aftermath of the war, ongoing regional and local rivalries, no doubt fueled Plataea's eagerness to promote its role as the host of the battle, since the global commodity of a discourse on freedom and liberation worked in its own local favor in conversations with and in quarrels with the Thebans. So it's not for nothing that this topic resurfaces full swing in Thucydides' Platean debate from 427. These are in any case my ideas about this. And what I've been hoping to demonstrate is that the local and regional discourse environment is immensely complicated before the arrival of the Persians. Different parties, different sides will have seen different assets and different benefits in the Persian presence at the time, because the Persians would be gone again at one point, but whether Plataea did belong to the Boeotians or not, might be something that uh, was to be uh, settled and put on a long-term trajectory. We don't know. Um, what I know is Herodotus' narrative is not helpful for this type of endeavor. So thank you very much for your attention. The chat's popping up. I have not had a chance to look at the chat yet. Looking forward to it. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, Hans, for this excellent talk that really presented a lot of texts that I wanted to present tomorrow, but never mind. <laughs> you had the priority 
in presenting this important uh, text. And it is very interesting what you said, you presented really the situation before the Persian Wars and how to explain the position of Thebes into the Persian Wars. And it is very interesting that in this tablet that you presented with properties in Asopos, we find also properties in other parts of Beosia, maybe even as far as Lebadia, uh, with the mention of Troponion. So it was really a kind of Theban hegemony before the fourth century and um, a big Thebes that dominated Beosia from east to uh, west. And we understand better the position, its position during the Persian Wars. Uh, so I, I open the, the floor for questions. Maybe uh, Nikos, Nicolas Papazarakadas, that was mentioned so many times, wants to respond. Um, can I be heard? Yes, Maybe. yes. Yeah, no, no, just very briefly, I want to say that what Hans Beck mentioned about the tablets um, is you no know, very reasonable. Uh, and that um, Yanis knows that uh, Angelos Matteo and myself have been studying the tablets for full publication, which we hope is going to be out in a couple of years. I mean, that's the realistic uh, time framework. Uh, but uh, uh, from what we've seen so far, I wouldn't say that uh, the inferences will be very different from what we've heard from Hans, although details might change, just that. But thank you, Hans. So Ian, Ian, do you want to? Yeah, I, I was actually just going to um, recall a, an article that I, I cited uh, Yohan Meloini's uh, talk on, on Macedonians uh, and the reason why they would have presumably found the Persian sort of incursion to be an opportunity, a really great opportunity to sort of like, once the Persians go out, suddenly we find ourselves in a really good, op a really good position to be in control of probably the Thracian area and all this kind of stuff. And I'm looking at this map of Boeotia and thinking about how Yanis characterized um, the sway that Thebes has, the dominance that Thebes has over a very, a pretty significant region. Um, and I'm thinking, that this is very much in their historical sort of uh, agenda to to maintain. So what if if it's under Persia a little bit? You know, I, we're so far away from Persia at this point. Hey, we work with these guys for a couple of years, and suddenly we have what we've wanted, which is unquestioned sovereignty over a pretty large region, uh, a region in specific that is really difficult to to sort of control. Um, so I was just wondering what you might think about that. Um, I kind of like the I kind of like the idea. Thank you for for expanding on this, Ian. Um, and I would add to this um, that medism is not something that's up in the air as something that is potentially dangerous. Um, not in five hundred and twenty. Not in five hundred and ten. Not in hmm. Well, I, I'm curious to hear what others have to say, but it's almost all Greek cities of Asia Minor collaborate in one way or another. There's nothing wrong with this in moral terms. There is not even a moral discourse of allegations and notions of betrayal at the time. Um, I realize that it's there later, and I realize that it kicks in in those many, in those early years of the fifth century, but um, again, it's not a, moral, a morally corrupt thing to do. It only becomes an utterly morally corrupt thing to have done after the event. But you might disagree with me on that, or you might have a different understanding of those decades. Take the Aegeanetans. The Aegeanetans were not charged with medism in 490. Nothing. They were just neutral. So it's a it's it's a it's a complicated discursive terrain that evolves very rapidly at a certain point, but not before five hundred. So, uh, Christopher. Um... Yes, kind kind of on the same point, but but 
changing the perspective. I mean, one is bound to wonder um, how keenly uh, the Persians were aware of this, of the story you've reconstructed here. Um, I mean, when Artabazus and Mardonius were, were, you know, we are told arguing about what the best way to actually seek the, the, the long-term aim of the expedition would be, whether it was to fight a battle or, or just go back to Thebes and sit tight and spend money. Um, were they conducting that at such discussion in some sort of informed knowledge that the Thebes of which they were talking was um, you know, an aggressive local, a power aggressively um, in search of local regional domination. And how did that sort of sit alongside the earlier point at which Mardonius is retailing to the Athenians? Um, you know, the suggestion that there could be a future in which, well, Athens is, Herodotus says, autonomous, a striking use of a word that will not have been around in 479, I think. Um, and with kind of imputation that, that they are so detached, as it were, from the Persian thing that presumably they constitute a regional um, power in their own right, with which Persia is somehow in a, well, not exactly a treaty relationship, but in some sort of relationship um, of a very special sort. I mean, um, when, they argue, when he argued with Mar Mardonius, Artabazus, uh, Mardonius was, was kind of still, a, well, was arguing against the view that Thebes was a good place to, to, to play from, so to speak. I guess he'd passed beyond thinking Athens was a place to play from. But I, I just find myself wondering, or, or whether these people arrived sovereignly unconcerned with these local, the, the local history, if you like. Hard to speak for those individuals, especially mm. after all these years. But they spent a lot of time in Thebes, mm. and they talked a lot with Theban leaders, the Theban leadership, other Boeotian leaders. That's for sure. Uh, that's mm. the one. That's the one fact in the Ataginos in the Ataginos Symposium to me and. Uh, I'm not sure if, if Sam will return to this or not. Um, but uh, so, yeah, they talk, right? I mean, we, that's the, the, the structural data. And they talk on countless nights uh, during parties, during strategy briefings, during planning sessions. They hang out there like an entire winter um, into the spring period. Um, so... I think they are well aware of what happens on the ground. They realize that Plataea is not on their side. They realize where the front lines are, where the division lines are in Boeotia. They have to run logistical operations in Boeotia over months to feed their troops. So they must be aware of anything that happens from Delphi through the Kopais region into the Theban region, into the Parasopia toward Tanagra, because they need the resources. So I would assume that whatever Herodotus has to say about this, they know the landscape fairly well. Yeah, I, can I just come in there? I mean, I think without, without wishing to get my, my powder too wet before going into the next, <laughs> the next paper, um, the, um, this is basically the bit of um, um, an article I had published last year that I won't be talking about is, is very much these, these questions, which are that I think that, that the, um, the, the local uh, political discourse that goes on from the, from the end of the 6th century into the, into the 5th century is, is exactly what the Thebans are, are playing with here, um, I think, um, and, and they're just they're using the Persians for, for everything that they can get, um, and it's just, it's local, it's local conflicts, um, and they're using the Persians um, to further their own, their own position, um, particularly in the Kitharon Parnes range, um, and we see this with the engagement of uh, the Parosopeans, um, who are this mysterious group that sort of hang out in the mountains? The Thebans are using this this opportunity with the, with the Persians to to start sort of pulling the levers of these of these strange groups and getting them to do what they want them to do um, under the under the aegis of the sort of uh, Persian collaboration. Um, so I, I see this very much as um, business as usual for Thebes, but with this with this sort of uh, big partner behind it helping them out. 
Yes, yes, Samuel, that's an excellent point. And I would like to ask you both, especially Hans and you, what about the Koinon? Do we have a confederation, a midizing confederation, or is it all about Thebes? Do we have something like a proto Koinon in Boeotia at the end of the sixth century? Or is it, is it only Thebes? Because we're talking mainly about Thebes, but what Herodotus says as Boeotus Telein is also participate in a Koinon. This is, this is a, a very difficult question, but... Well, for, for me, the really telling inscription is, is the one from um, Olympia, I think put up by the, by the Thespians and the Plataeans um, mm -hmm. just shortly after the war, um, because they are very keen to differentiate themselves from the other Boeotians. Because we, we know that all the other Boeotians are quite happily on the, on the Theban and Persian side, as far as we're aware. The, the Thespians and Plataeans obviously have a very different experience, but they're still recognizably very Boeotian. And so they're putting up this inscription at, at Olympia straight after the war saying, we, we had nothing to do with this. Stop, call, stop saying the Boeotians medized. Um, you know, we, we didn't. Um, so remember that. Don't, don't start telling, telling stories about everybody medizing in Boeotia. Um, so there was, there was a sensitivity there, um, I think, straight after the war. One of the last occasions, Yanis, thank you for this question, a notorious question. One of the last occasions where you and I had met in person was at that conference that was then published, uh, the proceedings of, uh, uh, by Nicolas Papazarkadas uh, in Berkeley. And um, I collected in my presentation back then all of the epigraphic material for that mysterious question, what is it? What type of a coin on is it? And, and arguing with and, and learning from Stephanie Larson and others in this conversation, it's clear that the Boyotoy are on the agenda. Uh, they are there. And the latest epigraphic evidence says that they have Boyotarks. Um, now, again, the dating of that new Boyotark inscription is debated, um, but it's early to me in one way or another. It's on the cover of that 2014 volume, by the way. Um, so the, the, the Boyotoy are a real currency in, in political affairs, no matter how we want to uh, we, we want to recreate and, and understand their coin on. I think and one, they are one, somehow used right. by they are somehow used by the Thebans as a sim in order to dominate in Boeotia. But please let me give this the floor to, to my homonymous Yanis, who is waiting for a for a question for some minutes. Yes, Yanis. Uh, so that was an amazing insight into the real reasons that Thebes uh, joined the Persian cause and how they, into the real politic of the Theban um, side. <clears throat> but when uh, people have to go to war, usually they create um, a narrative that is usually much more simplistic than, you know, the real, reasons a state might take decisions. Um, and this narrative seems absent from Herodotus and other sources. Uh, so uh, I don't want to, to bring you know, modern politics but into the discussion, but uh, blinging the eye into what Natasha, how Natasha opened the, uh, the symposium yesterday. Uh, you know, you might People might say, we are going to liberate you and we're going to denazify you or whatever. So this is a narrative so that people can go to war and act believing that they are just in what they're doing. Everyone needs to uh, believe that they, they are on the on their, uh, right side of things. What would that narrative be for the Thebans, for the 10,000 of them or almost that? fought so vigorously. Thank you, Yanis. Um, I have tried to recreate the narrative after the event, i.e. the stories the Thebans told themselves and told to others about their role in two contributions, one in a monograph recently and one in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an article in the Ancient History Bulletin supplement. Um, but that's again after the war. How did they live with the idea of medicine and how did they 
what was their narrative strategy. You're asking what's the narrative at that point. And my answer to that would be, uh, hmm. I think Sam has already alluded to this in, or well, someone used the term realpolitik, right? It's almost, it's almost an, an Agesilaos type of thing. And it says, well, if it's good for Sparta, then it's good for whatever, then it's just in, in any sense. If this is good for Thebes, if this is the best for Thebes in our current situation, um, and if it allows, because I believe this is critical to, um, to regional conversations, if it allows different aristocracies in different locations in Boeotia to plug in and see a benefit in this type of narrative, that this is simply the most meaningful thing to do at this moment in time and get a bank for a buck, as it were, when the Persians are gone, then all of this will be part of, part of our domain, then this is probably a, com a convincing narrative, one that can one that you, that can be used to bring in other Boeotians and other central Greek states. I mean, bear in mind the narratives of the mid fifth century when the Thebans tab into into uh, Locris and into Euboean contexts and into other more Western contexts. They're always built to make this a purposeful realm or a purposeful sphere of influence and power independent from Athens and, and, and free, as it were, from Athens. That makes sense to many aristocracies at the time, not only in Boeotia, but also in Euboea, Locris, and Phocis. So I think that is probably something that, uh, that will have worked and arguably from a perspective of real and machtpolitik makes other terrible sense as it were so david please yeah uh uh hans thanks so much for this talk you you touched on something i'm i'm, I'm really fascinated on and that's when when does being allied with the persians become toxic when's that something you you just people just don't do um and i was trying to think back to this and and we have that very kind of murky moment when the greek allies the hellenic league votes to hold a tithe against anyone who medizes which kind of to support your argument would suggest that uh, their feeling is that way too many people are using treating this like politics as usual, right? And they're trying to definitely define that kind of alliance as something that's off the books now. You can't do that and still be in the club. Um, and I was trying to think of if that was the earliest moment we had this kind of this, this point where we're defining it differently. But when you mentioned something about Egina, it, it sparked something else in my mind. And that is that, that Leo Tychidas and Cleomenes head to Egina to exact punishment for their medism. Um, now, I don't know how much we want to trust Herodotus there. Are we retrojecting? It's certainly something Herodotus consistently believes, because if, if memory serves, don't, doesn't the, um, at Salamis, doesn't the Aegean-Eaton admiral shoot across the bow of Themistocles some sort of jive? Like, well, how do you like this for medism? Um, so whether we believe it or not, Herodotus consistently thinks that, that Egina did get into some kind of Medism related hot water early enough for Cleomenes to be associated with it. And I'm wondering if, if that gives us a moment to kind of think of a kind of a sliding scale, right? We have a moment when people are trying to identify Medism as something you don't do, but really it's a while before that really catches on in a way. Thank you, David. Uh, terrific. Um, it's this type of, of uh, historicization, as it were, of the discourse that I would like to understand better. And my reference in Plutarch makes it very, and, and, and Simonides' Plataea elegy makes this very clear that this is, it's right up there right after the battle and it must have been there before the battle. Um, but it's an argument that really built, it's a, it, it's a tide wave, yes, but it builds up. Uh, and it is hard for us and we should be very careful to use this as, as an argument, as something that allows us to understand motivations and positionings of communities at a moment when this is not the big issue for them. I mean, uh, why is Argos, why, we all know this, why is Argos not part of this? Uh, because of Greek rivalries and Greek issues. Um, they've had their defeat already um, shortly before 
the Persian War. They've had their tremendous and 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 disastrous loss already. They wouldn't want to do this again and commit to anything um, that was uh, headed by those who had eradicated a large number of their citizen body. 